Okay, welcome back everyone. So now we will have our second session. Amanda, would you introduce Dr. Wendy? So for our next session, we'll be focusing on the valorization of palm biomass. So allow me to introduce our next guest speaker, Aya Dr. Wendy Ng. So Aya Dr. Wendy graduated uh, with a PhD degree from University of Nottingham, Malaysia in 2014. So she's a chartered professional engineer recognized by the engineers of Australia and also a professional engineer recognized by the Board of Engineers Malaysia. So before joining Curtin University and also UTB as a lecturer, so Aya Dr. Wendy has worked as a project engineer in the palm related commercial sector. So now the Aya Dr. Wendy is also affiliated with UTB and also the event director for iChemi Poxic. So next, uh, if the participants have any questions, they can also drop their questions in the Slido link that will be provided in the chat box right now. So I'll pass the floor to Doc Aya Dr. Wendy right now. Thanks for the introduction. Okay. A very good afternoon, everyone. This is Wendy. And today I'm representing iChemy Popsic um, to briefly introduce you about the Popsic and then to present a topic on the biomass from the palm oil industry. Here, iChemy stands for Institution of Chemical Engineers. We have currently we have more than 37,000 members in more than 100 countries. Uh, more than 100 countries and we have offices in different countries and then uh, these are some of the members uh, for iChemy we can divide into different members group one is the um, uh, iChemy members group by country another one is what we have that is the spatial interest group pump uh, pop palm oil processing spatial interest group falls under one of the spatial interest group and then what does POPSIC does is that POPSIC provides a forum to enable knowledge transfer, exchange of best practices, and sharing of experience to all that are interested in the palm oil industry. POPSIC is launched uh, in KL in 2015 on the 3rd of the August. It is one of the communities of the ICAMI members. Uh, we aim to provide a forum for the exchange of the ideas, the sharing and the sharing of experience, and to encourage any innovations in the palm oil uh, processing industry. We welcome volunteers that are passionate about the palm oil industry to join us. Even though Popsic is uh, a members group of iChemE, where we know that iChemE is for the chemical engineers, but we are actually not limited, uh, not limiting our members to only chemical engineers. We do welcome mechanical engineers and other engineers from different disciplines to join us. As we always emphasize, we encourage to share and promote best, uh, the best practices um, in the palm oil industry. And we will encourage innovations in palm oil processing and to develop palm, new palm products. And we also promote professional aspects of the palm oil industry. And the most importantly, we act as a focal point for everyone that are interested in the process related to oil palm processing. Our, we have many kind of activities. Our typical activities will include to organize technical seminars, forum workshop, webinars, and physical evening talks. Uh, we do um, jointly organize events with organizations and institutions like MPOC, Mostar, Monash University, like what we have today as well. Uh, we participate, we organize uni uni University Roadshow since 2019. And then this has involved more than 20 universities with chemical engineering. This aims to introduce palm oil to students, but in particular when we have university events and to review opportunities in the palm oil processing industry. These are some of the roadshows that we have uh, organized previously. After 2020, previously we have physical roadshows and after 2020 uh, with the COVID lockdown, we organized virtual roadshows. And then since 2020, we have organized 
three virtual events with different universities like Swinburne, Curtin, UMS, SEGI, UTM, UPM, and so on. And other than roadshows, we do have site visits. This is before MCO, where we have physical site visits. And then after MCO, we have virtual site tours. These are some of the screenshots that we have taken when we have our virtual site tours. We do participate in university events where we are invited to university events when university like UM, UTM, when they have their student chapter festivals. So we'll chip in to support their uh, activities as well. We have our newsletter. In this year, we will publish four newsletters, one each for every quarter, to report on what we have organized and our future events together with any new opportunities in the palm oil industry. And as, as we always know that uh, currently the global movement focused very much on climate change. ICAMI has presented its position on climate change. POPSIC, as a member group, a special interest group, we have developed climate change action plan that outline plans and initiative for contributing to this position. If you would like to know more or to support us in our activities, you are most welcome to visit the website www.icami.org slash palm climate actions. And ICAMI Malaysia what is one of the main highlights of ICAMI area. Uh, there is one award that is related to Palma industry. There's the ICAMI Malaysia Palma Industry Award. Every year, we will welcome organizations, any partnerships or teams, or even individuals to submit applications to our ICME Malaysia Palm Oil Industry Award. And this year, the application has opened, so everyone is free to submit and welcome to submit. And previously, we have winners from Sun Dhabi, uh, Excel White, IOI Edibles Oil, and Sun Swim Solutions. Other than the previous activities that I have mentioned, this is a good news to students and academics, actually. We do offer awards and bursaries, and our application for year 2022 has opened. That for each of these categories, we offer cash prizes and certificate of achievement if you are one of our winners. And one among one of the uh, awards that we offer is the Popsic Best Final Year Design Award. Every year, the Popsic awards this best final year design award to a group of final year students, final year chemical engineering students, where their final year project design revolve around the palm oil processing. If you are a third year or fourth year students that you have completed your design project or currently taking a design project, then you are encouraged to join our, uh, to submit an application to our best final year design award. Uh, this award, it offers a cash price of 2,000 ringgit per group. And this is some, these are some of our winners where we have winners from UTM in 2019, Fair Award in 2020. And last year, our award goes to UCSI University. And this year, the award is open. The deadline of submission is 15 of August. For more information, you may visit our ICAMI website. And next is that, our POPSIC also provides financial assistance in the form of student bursaries. And this one is the POPSIC student bursary for conference to undergraduate and postgraduate students to attend scientific conferences, workshops, or forums that are related to palm oil processing. And the aim of this event is to spur the in, uh, students' motivation and to support your research in the palm oil processing. And the bursary, each of these bursary is worth 1,000 ringgit. And the application is open as well. You are free to submit your application. And next, we do have another bursary that we call it the PubSIC Student Research Project. And uh, for this, we are committed to promote palm oil rated researchers among the undergraduate and postgraduate degrees as well. And this bursary, it offers up to a maximum of 3,000 ringgit per project to the students. We will offer several bursaries per year that the students will undertake a six-month original research that is related to the palm oil sector. 
So the application, the deadline for application this year falls on the 15th of August, 2022. You are most welcome to submit your application to the research bursary as well. Our ICAMI Pop Seek event is free of charge to everyone. So if you are interested, you are please feel very free to visit our ICAMI website and social medias for more information. These are some of our events that we are going to help next after this event, where in the May we have webinar, that we have a webinar that's related to process safety management. In the mid of May, we have another webinar to be delivered by IR4. Uh, and then in June, we have a webinar about the potential of industry 4.0 in the palm oil industry. And then in the end of the 29, we have another roadshow with Swinburne University. And then in July and August, we have webinars that is um, co-organized with APROS. This is also related to the palm oil sector. And then in August, we have our symposium of Malaysian chemical engineers. If you want to know more about POPSIC, here is our website, icame.org slash palm, where you can find all our activities, our archive to our previous event, and our any future opportunities for both students and the public. And here is our introduction to POPSIC. Next, this is our this is my topic of presentation of the day. Before we look into biomass, we will, I would like to go through very briefly the palm oil extraction process where the where the where most of our palm biomass from the palm oil in the palm from the palm oil industry origins. Palm oil is uh, traditionally used for edible purpose, like to produce cooking oil for frying and so on. As we know that, okay, let me show my laser pointer. This is a palm tree where we have our palm, palm fruit grow on the palm tree. So when this is a person harvesting a palm fruit, so this is the palm fruit that we harvest. This is what we want actually. And these fruits, a bunch of fruit, we call it FFP in short, a full name that is the fresh fruit bunch that we always say. And the fresh fruit bunch, as you see here, it is made up of a lot of fruitless as you, uh, as you see over here. In the fruitless, we can um, extract two types of oil. One type we call it the palm oil, the other type we call it the palm kernel oil. The palm oil is the oil that is uh, available in the yellow orange fresh here. As in, we actually squeeze the yellow color fresh. This is a fibrous like material to get our palm oil. In fact, our crude palm oil. And then the palm kernel oil is the oil that we get from the white color region over here. So this is the fruitless. Uh, in one bunch of FFB, we can have many fruitless. And after we take off all the fruitless, this is what we have, the remaining stock, if that is what we call the EFB, the empty fruit bunch. Okay, here, this is the typical palm oil milling process. But after we have this FFB, this FFB will be sent to palm oil mill. Uh, that is where we process, where we get our crude palm oil. So this FFB here will be arrived to the palm oil mill at the receiving unit. Then it will go through a sterilization process where we will um, we will bake it so that we soften the fruit. Then in the threshing process, this is where we take up the fruitless from the bunch. Okay. Therefore, at the end of the threshing drum, we will actually have sterilized fruit, our fruitless, and the empty fruit bunch. And this empty fruit bunch is one of the main palm biomass that we have. And then this fruitless will go through extraction process where we'll go through pressing process to extract the crude palm oil. And then after the pressing, we actually have the fibers, the yellow color, the remaining fiber left. And that remaining fiber is the mesocarp fiber, which in short, sometimes we call it a PMF, palm mesocarp fiber. And then in the fiber, we actually have a mix of the fiber and the kernels. As you see, the middle part here where the black color and the white color 
um, leftover seeds that we have. And then this kernel will be sent to a crushing process where the crushing process, in the crushing process here, the seeds, uh, the shell, the black color shell will be crushed. Uh, then the shell is what we call the palm kernel shell. And then the remaining, the, the inside, the white color things, will go through an ex extraction process where we get our palm kernel oil. And then when we extract our palm kernel oil, there are actually um, uh, a cake from the remaining slurry form. That is what we call the palm kernel cake. Okay. And then this is a photo of the palm kernel shell, as you see. And this is a photo of the mesocarp fiber. And then there's another main type of the palm biomass that we always refer to as palmer, the palm oil meal fruit. And this palmer is actually a collective term for the wastewater in the palm oil meal that is uh, channeled out from the palm oil meal. It is mainly formed um, by the condensate of the sterilization process and the uh, wastewater from the purification process. So for each of this uh, biomass, uh, every year, and these are the species of biomass we have where in general, we have empty fruit, like palm kernel shell, decanter cake, and the palm mesocarp fiber, palm oil fruit, palm oil meal even from the palm oil meal. Uh, outside palm oil meal in the palm plantation, we have different type of palm biomass as well. But when we refer to palm biomass, we say that every year we generate uh, a very high amount of palm biomass. And this palm biomass is typically from the palm oil meal. And these are the types of the palm biomass that we generally have inside a palm oil meal. And just now, uh, we actually miss out a decanter cake. Decanter cake is the sludge that we refer to over here. Decanter cake is a solid waste that's produced from a three-phase separation step of the crude palm oil process. It's typically used um, as an organic fertilizer as well. It can substitute some of the chemical fertilizer dose due to the macro and micronutrient elements that is especially high in nitrogen level. Okay, so when we say that how much biomass that we have, uh, we can actually calculate based on the FFB that we receive from the meal. And then in Malaysia, uh, up to 2021, this is a static statistic in end of 2021, we actually have 5.7 million hectare of the land that's planted with the palm, uh, oil palm tree. And of course, with this area, as in the more land that is planted with more palm tree, the more palm fruit that we will have. Okay. And then in 2021, we actually have received 91 million ton of FFB at all the palm oil mills in Malaysia. This is a static, uh, statistics recorded by MPOB. And for FFB received at mills, that means received by all the 451 mills in 2021 in Malaysia. We currently have 451 palm oil mills as of year 2021. And then uh, by using the calculation method developed by MPOB in 2020, uh, 2009, we actually estimated that we have this amount of the uh, palm biomass in 2021, as in about 61 million of palm oil effluent, 7 million of EFB, 4.2 million of palm kernel shell, and 7.4 million of palm mesocarp fiber. The value may be, because this is an estimation, the value may differ differ slightly depending on the sources because these are dry weight. If the moisture content is high from certain sources, then the value could be less or could be more. And But the value would not go too far from this value actually. And then from the evolution of the palm oil industry, this, is, this could be the general perception from the public where in the previous time, how the world sees the palm oil is that the palm oil is actually a processing plant that only, pro that only produce CPO, crude palm oil, from the, uh, oil from the oil pump. However, and then what we what is taught, previously taught by the public is that other than the crude palm oil and then the rest of the biomass, uh, we got to figure out a way to dispose this kind of biomass, either to landfill or either to the plantation as 
to for mulching and then the wastewater it will be treated and then just discharge it to the um, river bank and so on. However, nowadays with the evolution of the palm oil industry, particularly in the, for the palm oil mill, we actually recover all the biomass and the waste we have to produce bioenergy and value added products. Here are some of the examples here. Other than having only crude palm oil, we can actually recover the palm biomass to produce pellet, fiber mat, fiber for power generation to get back our uh, clear water to get fertilizer and so on. These are only some of the examples. We can actually produce more products depending on the technologies that is available and the technologies that is employed by the palm oil mill owners. So here is a figure of the conversion of biomass into value added products. This is happening uh, in real life from one of the palm oil mill, the harvest oil mill. Okay, so we'll go through some of these processes one by one to introduce what kind of products that we can get from our biomass actually. Uh, most typically, we can actually produce palm biomass, uh, sorry, we can actually produce organic based fertilizer from the palm biomass. So how do we produce uh, fertilizer from the palm biomass? We actually have different technologies to get organic fertilizer from the palm biomass. And some of the seller, they could even take the sludge, that means the mesocarp fiber, and compose it to uh, produce a very raw kind of fertilizer. And some, they will went through some um, organic activities, some bio, biological activities to further improve the quality of the palm biomass to get our fertilizer. So this is one of the examples where after the microbes activity, the fertilizer that we can get could have more than 5% of NPK. NPK is the nutrients in the fertilizers that we normally want. Because for fertilizer, we typically want this nitrogen, potassium, and uh, NP and K. K is the, what is it already? Uh, sorry, I can't recall the key. Potassium. Is one of it, P2O5 and uh, K, K2O. Okay. And then the uh, total, that means the N, P, and K composition after we sum up all, they could have more than 5% of it. And then organic matter, uh, it depends on how much organic materials that you have. It can be more than 20% or more than 30%, more than 40%, depending on the sources of material being used and also the... Um, uh, the way that we process it. And then moisture content typically less than 20% with a pH between eight to nine. And this organic fertilizer, we can further fortify it to include, so that we can get a higher NPK percentage. As in the NPK is the main nutrient that we want for our trees, for our uh, agriculture activities. In this case, if we were to use this fertilizer in our palm oil plantation, that means this is the nutrients that we want for our palm tree. And depending on how much, how the degree of fortification, you can get a different amount of the nutrient for the fortified fertilizer. It can be 5, 5, 10, 2, 5, 5, 10, 2, that means 5N, 5% N, 5% P, 10% K, and the 2 is typically referred to the magnesium content or any customized kind of composition that we want. And this would be some of the process flow of getting our fertilizer, where we can actually use the sludge, the mesocarp fiber, and sometimes the shredded EFB. And then we go through some uh, turning processes with some microbes, then after 30 days to 45 days of fermentation. And if you want to fortify it to increase the bo to boost the nutrient content, then we can go through a fortification process. If we just want a typical organic fertilizer, then we may not we may skip the fortif uh, fortification process to get our mature fertilizer. Then it goes through the packing to be sold to consumers. And it has been proven that fertilizer, organic fertilizer, is actually improve the growth of our trees, our uh, crops. Actually, as you can see here, if you apply 
250 gram of EOF, it means the Eureka brand's organic fertilizer, or it can be other brands of fertilizer as well. And then 300 grams, 350 grams, you can see that the growth of the root network is different when different amount of the fertilizer is used as compared to the chemical fertilizer. And next is that other than using palm biomass to produce our fertilizer, we can actually use palm biomass in this case, the EFP, the empty stock that we have, the fiber stock to produce dried long fiber. Then what is this dried long fiber is that we actually get the long fiber, we extract the long fiber out from the empty fruit bunch and then we dry it and then we uh, put them in bell to produce this dried fiber. This is in a bell where this bell can be sent to users to make their respective product. And then one of the products that we can see is actually the mattress filling. So it is not a surprise that could be the bad mattress that we sit at night, every night, is made of um, palm biomass as well. And then we do use this um, palm fiber and to press it to make it into the cushion as well, our uh, chair cushion. Okay. So other than making mattress, then we can have our long fiber to be stiff and pressed to make this fiber mat, where this fiber mat is used as um, for corrosion control, for example, or sometimes we also use for weed control as well. Or sometimes it's, this fiber mat is even being used as a um, floor mat, as decoration as well. And then next is that, uh, we, always, we also always say that we use biomass to generate biofuel. That is possible. If you remember, there's one type of palm kernel shell that we see just now. The palm kernel shell, it can be fit to boiler directly, to burn, to generate power. And then other than that, we can actually process palm biomass that is made out of, the, let's say, for example, the short fiber. There's the leftover from the EFB. After we get out, we take out the long fiber from the EFB. Uh, definitely, we know that for a bunch of the EFB, we can have long fiber and short fiber from it. So the short fiber, we can actually press it into a form of pellet, and then this can be put to boiler as a fuel source. Okay, And depending on the size that we have, we can have it as a pellet, a small pellet, or the briquette, a larger size pellet, we call it a briquette. And then these are the typical biofuel, the pellet that's before torrified. We can further improve the quality of the pellet by washing, by torrification, and so on. And then other than that, if you still remember, we actually have our palm oil milk efferin. The palm oil milk efferin actually contains um, components that can be decomposed and then uh, that we can get on microbes activity that we can get the methane gas from POMAC. So we actually use the balloon to capture our biogas, you see here, when there are gases, you can see this uh, balloon goes up, uh, raises in height. When there's less gas, then you see that it comes down, uh, it comes down to become flat and so on. So this gas is being collected and then sent to the, for example, this case sent to the biogas uh, power plant for power generations. And then the electricity they generated from the gas engine or turbine, it can be micro turbine, it can be a larger size turbine. Okay. And then this uh, power can be fit to the power meal for on consumption, power meal on consumption to support their own activities, the milling activities or the downstream activities. Or um, the miller can actually export the power generated to the grid through the fit-in tariff to earn some money from the grid, actually. From the, when the power is exported to the grid, that means the power will be fit to our home, to power our lights and so on, to power our daily activities. So typically for our 60 ton of palm oil milk, we can actually have um, about 3 megawatt of the power. And if we convert into the consumption of the coal to uh, generate this three megaton of power, 
then we can actually save more than 1.2 tons of the coal. And this 1.2 tons is definitely depends. It can be more up to 1.5 ton or less uh, up to one ton only, depending on the source of the coal. Because different sources of the coal, they will have a different carbon uh, composition, different calorific value and so on. And then when we convert it into per year basis, we can actually save more than 10,000 ton of coal per year. And this is equivalent to more than 9,000 ton of CO2 emission saving per year. And then the pump biomass that we have, we can, because after we use the uh, pome to generate biogas for power generation, this wastewater, the remaining wastewater, we can further process it into clear water quality to be recycled. And definitely this depends on uh, the technologies that you use. If you are using a better technology, then you get a higher priority water. If your technology that you use is not that premium, then probably the quality of the water will not be that premium actually. And then, and of course, the different quality of water will determine how you can use the water for. You can use it for boiler, could be if the water quality is very, very high, or even for drinking or just for daily washing kind of activity, it depends. And what kind of technologies that we have, for example, Alpha Lava, they have the um, uh, technologies to process it into clear water quality. And we also have uh, electrocoagulation as well that can, they use electricity to get this clear water quality water from the pomac. Next is that uh, for the integration of the technologies, because we have a lot of this high um, pump biomass, pump-based biomass. And of course, to recover or not to recover the pump biomass, it depends on the pump oil mule because these are the pump oil, uh, biomass that is originates from the pump oil mule. So the owner can actually sell the biomass for the third party to process the biomass or to recover the biomass themselves to produce value-added products and bioenergy. And there are actually many untapped sources of energy in Malaysia currently. And for continuous sustainability and improved technology efficiency, we actually need technology because it is the technology that determines the efficiency, economy, and sustainability of this um, utilization of pump biomass, sustainability of the pump oil mill. For one single technology, it is because it will not be sufficient to solve all of our problem. Because like what the in some of the intro technologies that we introduced previously, the technology is that one technology will recover one type or probably one or two type, a mixture of one or two type of biomass to produce only one type of the product. If we only have one single type of technology, that means you can recover lightly one type of product to produce one type of one type of biomass to produce one type of product only. So what we can do is that we can have an integration of technology to form a biorefinery actually. So what is biorefinery is that biorefinery is a implementation of the process integration where we actually introduce different type of the technology and we intro, integrate them uh, in one of the integrated process that we call to produce different, to recover different type of biomass to produce different type of product. Here, we actually, we involve the technologies to recover, um, to recover biomass to produce bioenergy. And the bioenergy will be used to support the activities of, to support all these downstream activities to convert our biomass into the value-added products. Like for example, this is a sample of process integration for a uh, Palmer refinery, where the Palmer is actually being recovered for, through a biogas system to produce um, power, where the remaining water can be further processed into clear water quality for recycled again to the Palmer mill for the daily activities. And then the power is used to um, support all these activities, the downstream activities, for example, to recover the EFB, to produce a dry-on fiber for our um, 
uh, for our mattress production, for example. And then dried long fiber can be further processed into fiber mat if we are not selling the dried long fiber directly. And then the fiber mat can be later sell for many purposes. And then other than that, we can also recover the short fiber from the fiber fiberizing system to produce pellet, where the pellet we can actually use for power generation or sell to third party for power generation as well. And then we can also um, use boiler age, any mesocarp fiber or even some short fiber um, in our composite system to produce our organic fertilizer and fortified fertilizer, where this fertilizer can be uh, sent back to our plantation for fertilize, uh, to fertilize our palm tree. And then decanter cake, uh, it can be used for used in the composting system to produce fertilizer, or it can be sent for animal feed plant to produce animal feed as well. And of course, if we were, we can actually integrate more activities here in a biorefinery, for example, other than the decanter cake, we actually have the palm kernel cake, where the palm kernel cake can be channeled to this animal feed plant to produce animal feed as well. And then the palm kernel shell, it can be fit into this power. Uh, here, this is for biogas power generation system, where we can actually have a biomass power generation system where we use our either EFB, either a process EFB, or we can use our PKS, the so palm kernel shell for power generation as well. And the power generations, the power that we have, it can be sent to the grid, sent to the oil mill, or to support the downstream activities. And for this, we can actually reduce the amount of the waste from the palm oil mill. In fact, if we uh, have a very optimized kind of scenario, we can actually recover all, our, all the biomass that we have in our palm oil mill to generate product. From there, we actually uh, achieve resource sustainability through an optimized processes. We also uh, achieve energy conservations where the energy generated from the biorefinery is actually sufficient to support the activity of the whole palm oil mill and the downstream activities. And for the any extra, we can export to the grid as well. And of course, it actually the owner for these productions, they can actually get additional income. So in conclusion is that there are very high potential of palm biomass available for the production of bioenergy and the value added products. It's a matter of how much, uh, how much resources that we manage to tap and then that we manage to convert into bioenergy and value added products to generate more income. And then for energy sustainability, we can actually use the power generated to support our activities from here, we can actually reduce the reliability to our fossil fuel and also to extend the life cycle of the biomass because now they are now uh, being converted into value added products. So we can actually extend the lifetime of this biomass. So with technological advancement, we can produ produce more products from the biomass. Uh, for all the biomass products that we discussed is only some of them only. Definitely, we have more technologies to produce more product. Here are actually some of the um, other uses of palm biomass as you see here. With a mixture of the palm biomass, uh, the EFB, the decanter cake, and to with some sodas. So with a right proportion, the con with a right control temperature and moisture content, we can actually use it for our oyster mushroom production as you see over here. Okay, so this is uh for this is these are some photo of mushroom cultivations. And then we can also use palm biomass, press it into shape to make pots and containers and to make some paper products as well. And then just now what we have covered is the palm biomass in the palm oil mill. In fact, you must have heard about the replantation of the palm, the palm plantation. So when we do replantation, we actually cut down the palm trees. So the cut, the palm tree that's been cut down, we can actually recover this palm tree for medium density fiber production as well. In short, we call it the MDF, the medium density fiber board, as you see over here. This medium density fiber board, we can use it for furniture, to make furniture, to build furniture as well. It is not 
surprised that uh, this actually happens in, you can see this probably in many of our furniture. In fact, the chair that I'm sitting on uh, the, is made of this medium density fiber board actually. And then other than that, we can use this uh, palm oil palm trunk to make plywood as well. There are actually a few palm plywood plants in Malaysia. So if you're interested, then you may, if I'm not mistaken, I think one is in Malacca. So you can actually, you feel free to Google the palm plywood plants in Malaysia, then you'll come up with a few search results actually. So you, if you are really interested, you may organize some visits to ask if you can have a site visit to the plants and so on. And these are more to a lower value kind of uh, value added products. And we do use palm biomass to produce higher value added products like bioethanol and so on. And this definitely some are yet to be commercialized and some are still under R&D stage. So it depends on the technology uh, advancement and the willingness of the investment, then we can actually convert our palm biomass to a more variety of the uh, value added products. And what we have presented here all, they are actually commercialized kind of uh, commercial process that has been in operations. So this is a relatively short presentation. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to voice out your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wendy. If it's okay, no share my screen. Uh, are you able to hear me? You mean me? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, yes. I uh, just wanted to let me share my screen. Okay. Oh, slime. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Wendy, for your informative talk regarding bio biorefinery and um, biomass. I'm sure that uh, most of us taking chemical engineering are quite familiar with palm biomass and um, biorefinery because I think a lot of us are, have assignments related to it. So it was very interesting to see all the pictures and the processes that you um, shared with us. It was also very um, interesting to see and understand more about the different ways of sustainably converting um, the biomass into useful products. I personally have not I'm not aware of those products, but thank you for sharing that with us. So we will now proceed to the Q&A session. So um, Shetty, you can share your screen. I will be- Yeah, I actually went into the Slido and I saw some questions here actually. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, Dr. Wendy, I will be moderating this session. So um, I'll just read out the questions and you can choose if you would like to answer them or not. Uh, I, I try to answer all the questions since I think we have sufficient time for it. Okay, okay, sure. Okay. Uh, okay, the, okay, the shortest one, this one first. Does Pome release more methane than CO2? Um, in terms of, in terms of, if we talk about, uh, we cannot really see we, we cannot really see the amount of the methane and the amount of the CO2. We cannot compare directly because methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas as compared to the CO2, actually. And then we say that the global warming potential, the global warming effect of methane is much more higher than carbon dioxide. It's more than 20, more than 25, around 30 times the global warming potential of methane is around 30 times more than CO2. So if we say that, if we, if we were to consider to say is Pome release more methane than CO2, then we will, it's more accurate to say that the impact of methane will be for the green, to get the greenhouse effects is much more higher than CO2. 
as in one gram of methane will be uh, 30 times more, uh, more harmful than one gram of CO2. Yes. And then is that possible to capture 100% of methane from polymer to net zero? This one, when we say it's about this 100% methane as we are chemical engineer, we all know that there's no such thing like 100% efficiency. It's that just that your reaction, you won't be able to achieve 100% efficiency. So we cannot control that they may be leaking from the, let's say just now you can see that we are using uh, most of the uh, biogas is being captured using a membrane. So we cannot say that the methane will be able to capture 100% of methane. It's just that there may be some leakage, uh, physical leakage, or because we know that we actually get methane from the bio, from met, uh, methane genesis, from the uh, microbes activity. So we cannot ensure that all the components inside the meat, inside the polymer, as in whatever that can be converted into methane, is being is being converted into methane. So that is, we cannot ensure okay. that there is a hundred percent efficiencies to say is that is it possible to capture hundred percent of methane. So this is just something like is it possible to have a hundred percent of uh, reactions in the reactor? Okay. Are there actually downside from recovering the biomass? If we say downside, then um, probably we can have but it depends on how do you look at it actually. Because the downside, you see, normally we say that uh, the more process we have, if you look at the safety side, that means uh, the more process we have, the more steps we have, that means the more process safety issues that we can have, that means the more accidents that we can get, then that is probably one of the downside from recovering the biomass. But in terms of when you say the environmental impact as in the amount of waste to be disposed, the amount of the um, uh, emissions and then the economic income, then we can very safe to say that they are actually more upside from recovering the biomass than the downside. And then how economical are the processes to convert palm biomass into environmental friendly product? Are they energy intensive process? This one, it depends on what type of energy, uh, what kind of process that you that we have actually. When we say that um, when we to convert pump biomass into fertilizer, then this is not an energy intensive process because the amount of energy use is the power use is just for, in that case, from the photos that I show you, you just need a building, you need some microbes, you need manpower, and then you need the power for packaging, and then you need um, probably some diesel fuel to run the turning machine. So it is not energy extensive. However, when we say that, if we were to convert pump biomass into, let's say the, uh, the fiber mat, then you need more energy as in you need, first you need to have, uh, you need to dry the EFB because EFB is very wet and then you need a lot of energy to dry it out. And then you need uh, to convert the long fiber into fiber mat, then you need some stitching, then you need hot press, all this will consume energy. So it depends on the what type of process you are looking into and then what kind of, um, is the process energy intensive or not intensive? So it is, we cannot really say that it's all very energy intensive or, or not intensive. How economical are the process to convert palm biomass into environmental friendly product? So this depends actually, because some is very economical as in the cost that you involve is um, very low actually. And then some will be very expensive. And then for example, some, oh, this is, biodiesel is not a good example. So um, 
how economical, as in those, I can only say those being commercialized, that means you are earning money. Those that has yet to be commercialized, that means it's either uh, very energy content intensive or it is not earning money yet or the efficiency is very low or there could be some other issues. Are there many job opportunities in the palm oil industry and is it good at industry attribution? I would say yes, palm oil industry all the while they are hiring. There are many job opportunities and then it will say that it is a good industry for the future. Uh, this one depends though because as we know that previously there has been many environmentalists actually attacking our palm oil industry saying that it's not sustainable and so on. And then some of them also, some of the country, they also ban our palm oil saying that it is um, palm, contain palm oil, so they don't want to sell it in their country. However, there's a different say now due to the shortage of the um, sunflower oil. They will say that, oh, palm oil is a good source to substitute the current uh, short forming of the oil supply from other countries. So they now start to sell our palm oil again. And that's why our palm oil price actually hiked so much recently due to the war. So we say that it's a good industry in the future. I would say yes, with proper control and planning. So our palm oil is not that it is not sustainable, just that with if it is properly planned, properly controlled, properly regulated, it can be a very sustainable industry as well, which that we are now moving towards that uh, sustainable direction. But job opportunity, yes, all the while the power industry are hiring. Do you see any potential for the various products from palm biomass in replacing the conventional traditional products? This one, I would say yes, actually. For example, uh, one very typical example that we discussed just now, the, I'm trying to use the examples that we have gone through in our slides just now so that you can have a clearer picture of it, what is it actually. For example, conventional product, one of it is the, uh, let's say, the long fiber. Okay, now we are using long fiber to replace our latex mattress to replace the coconut fiber. So it's actually a cheaper option, actually. If you say that, do I see any potential? Yes, the potential is high because every year we are exporting so much dry long fiber for uh, this kind of consumer, consumer products production. And then another example could be the fertilizer, for example, when there is a shot of fertilizer nowadays in the market. So the fertilizer that is produced from the palm biomass is at a very good market as well. So it's actually replacing our traditional chemical fertilizer as well. So if you ask me, do I see a potential for the various product for palm biomass in replacing the conventional traditional product? Yes, because this is typically economic driven actually. Econom nowadays, economic and environmental, environmental impact driven. As long as our product is economically competitive, environmentally competitive, then yes. Okay. And then is this is the conventional pomme pond still widely seen practice? Uh, yes, the conventional pomme pond is still widely seen practice in Malaysia despite the need of the very high land footprint. Because our industry, uh, from many, many years ago, we have our palm oil industry, we have our palm oil mill. And then from there onwards, when they have it, they already they are already generating the uh, palm oil milk effluent. So when they have a uh, palm oil milk effluent, that means they are having their ponds. Just the matter is that previously, the pond may not have methane capture, uh, may not have methane capture facility. And now they are actually installing these methane capture facilities to capture methane, either for flaring or for biogas, to, to get biogas for power generation. 
there are many biomass from palm oil industry. Why don't they just turn into fertilizer? Um, there could be many reasons for it because biomass, actually the fertilizer from the palm oil industry, there are different quality of this fertilizer from the palm oil industry. First thing is that we have seller that takes the decanter cake mesocot fiber, they mix it and then they sell it as fertilizer directly. There are also users that process it with microbes activity and so on, as through thermophilic, mesophilic activities to produce higher quality fertilizer that is comply with the serum uh, organic fertilizer standard. So uh, why don't they just turn into fertilizer? The barriers could be because when you want to turn this into fertilizer, that means you need some investment. Many barriers to this technology is that it needs investment. As in, is the owner willing to invest more for a new technology to produce this kind of product? Or the owner, owner is actually satisfied with the current situations where they think that um, I do not have the manpower to take care of this uh, new production activity. Mm -hmm. I may not have the um, uh, manpower with the appropriate knowledge to take care of this pro new processing line. Or some, because when we have a new product, we need to take care of our marketing as well. We turn into fertilizer, we need to be able to sell it as well. So if some of the owner, they may say that um, they don't want to spend more effort into the marketing of fertilizer, then this is another criteria already. So there are many aspects that has to be considered. Why not they just turn into fertilizer? Or some, because now we say that a fertilizer, uh, there's a big proportion of the agriculture activities is still using chemical fertilizer. So if they were to all turn into fertilizer, that means the amount of the organic fertilizer in the market will increase very significantly at a sudden. So can the market uptake this amount of the fertilizer? And is the market willing to uptake this amount of the fertilizer? It depends on the user has the confidence to switch their application of chemical fertilizer to organic fertilizer or fortified fertilizer or not. This is another issue that has to be considered. And then the biomass or the biological waste also release CO2 and methane. Is biomass a sustainable resource? Um, yes, if you see in that case, biomass also release CO2 and methane. So this is the matter of uh, the emission is released now or released later, okay? If you don't do any conversion, you just let it be, then it will emit the gases uh, quite immediately if you put it into mulching. So when it decomposes, it actually emits the greenhouse gases. So if you convert it into biomass product, as in the value added product, you actually extend its life cycle. So probably eventually it may still de it will still decompose and it will still release these greenhouse gases. However, you got to think in a way that when you have this biomass being converted into the biomass product, you extend the life cycle. That means you are delaying the time that it, re it releases this, um, this emission. And at the same time, when your biomass is being converted into certain product, that means the existing product that is the product that if originally is made by other sources, that means you are reducing the consumption of the other fresh resources that is originally used to produce that product. So in that case, you are indirectly reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from the exploitation of the original resources. So if you say is biomass a sustainable resources, yes, all the while is sustainable because in one way it's renewable as well.
Given that oil palm expansion is limited by the government, does this limit the future job opportunities for engineers? Uh, I would say no, it won't limit the future job opportunities for engineers because as far as I know, the power industry is actively hiring. And another thing is that the power industry actually hire a lot of um, foreign worker. So probably in future when there is a time that if one day everyone is fighting for the for a job opportunities from the palma industry then it will translate to um competition between the local labor and the foreign labor when this happens then uh, is a matter of the policy it could be our national policy is do are we going to have a policy that will be more protective to our local workforce or and of course this is very realistic to say so but this is a matter of the um, uh, income that is offered by the palm oil industry as well is our local workforce competitive in terms of salary when it's compared to the foreign labor but foreign labor is not cheap nowadays as well so if you say that does it limit the future job opportunities for engineer? I would say not at the current moment because when we trying to expand the downstream uh, activities, we are actually creating more job opportunities as well. For engineer job at Pome and Barmes Field, are they dirty, dangerous tasks? Uh, it depends on how do you compare though. I have seen dirty Pomoy meals. I have seen very clean Pomoy meals. So we cannot say that all power mills or, or all biogas power plant is dirty because they are really clean kind of power, biogas power plant or biomass power plant or the power mill as well. When you say the biomass fuel, it depends on what kind of biomass fuel you have. If there is a proper control with a very good um, management, then it won't be too dirty, I would say. If you say, is it dangerous? If all the safety precautions are followed, if there's a set of, um, if the workers are actually sensitive to the dangers at work, if the, normally, if all the protocols, SOP are followed, and when all the this kind of safety concern is being taken seriously, then I would say it, is not dangerous actually, but there are many negligence kind of cases that makes accidents to happen. So it's no matter you work in the palm oil sector or not in the palm oil sector, danger is there. Just that are we alert to the danger around us? Are we actually following all the SOP, the safety protocols? to avoid this kind of accidents. And of course, if you will say that if I were to work in a process plant, as compared to I were to work in the office in front of the laptop, then this is something not that can, this is something not uh, to be compared because this is not at the same working nature. Now, of course, we will say that working in front of the computer is clean as well, but it doesn't mean that there's no danger. We don't know that if I will fall from the floor, I will fall from the staircase, my laptop will explode, my handphone will explode from the side or not. So these are danger actually, just that uh, how frequent is the dangerous occurring? That's it. All right, I think that should be all for our questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy, for answering all of our questions. Before we um, end the uh, uh, your session, we would like to take a group photo. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, can everyone uh, turn on the cameras, please?
I'll just keep that. Is it okay? Yeah. So uh, one, two, three, so uh, uh, one, two, three, so thank you. Thank you for the session. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bendy, for your time and effort in sharing your experience and knowledge. Um, you may stay for the rest of the session or you may exit as you wish. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. So now that we have some time till the next speaker, we'll just take a break for time being and our next session will start at 2.30 p.m.